Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. This week, we're ready for a very exciting chapter in this prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah and chapter 12. Now, before we enter into this chapter, we need to remember a very important truth that we learned at the end of last week. And that was that Hashem, that is the God of Israel, that He is going to put into place. Now, probably the better way to say that is that He's going to allow a new world leader, one that He calls an idolatrous shepherd. And He is not going to do the job of a true Mashiach but he's going to be the false Messiah, the Antichrist. And in the end, what do we see? Well, we see that there's going to be a sword placed upon his arm and upon his right eye. And what's going to happen? He is going to be destroyed. The question that we want to answer today and what we'll see in Zechariah chapter 12 is how his destruction is going to come about. And it won't be easy for the Jewish people. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Zechariah and chapter 12. There in the first verse, we see a word. And that Hebrew word is the word Messah, which is usually translated in English as a burden. It speaks about difficult times, persecution, and suffering. We saw that same word in the opening of Zechariah chapter 9 for that same purpose. And the suffering and the persecution is going to be upon, at first, the Jewish people and in the nation of Israel. Why do I say that? Well, look with me to that first verse. A burden, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now, Israel here is not just the land, but also the people. So there's going to be a burden promises the word of God for Israel. But there's an outcome of this burden. There's a purpose behind it. It says at the end of verse 1, For I will stretch out the heavens, and I will establish the earth, and I will create or form a spirit in the midst of man. Now, that language there, when he says, I'm going to stretch out the heavens and, and establish the earth, he's speaking about creation. But here's the point I want you to see. He's not talking about the creation that took place nearly 6,000 years ago, but we're talking about the creation, a new creation, which is understood in Judaism, and I think rightly so, as the redemption, God's work of redemption. Because we know when a person accepts Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, into their life, the scripture says in many different places, that person becomes a new man or a new creation. So biblically speaking, prophetically, the second creation is talking about the time of redemption which will give birth to the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, if you pay attention to that word for form or create in regard to a spirit in the midst of man, it's it's similar to what we read in the book of Genesis in chapter two and verse seven. But there's, there's two small differences. That word, vayotzer, here in Hebrew, to, to create or form, is written with one Hebrew letter at the beginning, the Hebrew letter yud. That's what we would expect. But in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 7, it's written with two yuds. That's a very small Hebrew letter, but great in significance. And the rabbis give a couple different uh, interpretations why. The interpretation that's most relevant for us here is that the two letters, repetition of that Hebrew letter Yud, according to the rabbis, is for two creations of man. The first creation for this world 
and the second yud for the second creation, that is redemption. Well, here we only see one yud, that letter appears one time, to help us understand we're talking about the second creation, that's the context, or redemption, that is life for the kingdom. And instead of the expression, and he, he placed, he literally blew his, his spirit, the spirit of life into man, that's what we read in the book of Genesis. Here we see a change from the word neshema for, for spirit or breath in the book of Genesis to the word spirit. And once again, when we're talking about the, the nature of man, the essence, we see that man has a soul, he has a spirit, but there's two different words used biblically for spirit. The word neshema is a lower spiritual uh, meaning, has a lower spiritual meaning than the second word, ruach, which is very spiritual and connected to redemption. Those who are redeemed, God places his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in us. And that's what he's speaking about here. Let's move on to verse 2. Now, we mentioned that in verse 1, there's that word masa burden, speaking of troublesome times. Well, now we get a picture of those troublesome times. Verse 2, Behold, I am, am, am setting Jerusalem, or making a Jerusalem, a saf ra'al. Now, the word saf in Hebrew can have a couple different meanings. If you go by the rabbis, they say that it should be understood with the word sephel, which is a, a cup or a mug, a cup of poison. But that same word saf, can be for a, a threshold of a door. And it speaks about a transition. So both of these meanings are right. When the nations come up to Jerusalem to make war, the end result for them is going to be, that action is going to be akin to taking poison. But it's also going to bring a transition, a change. And that transition is from this age to the age of the kingdom that is the return of Messiah and the kingdom that he's going to establish. And who's going to come up to Jerusalem for war? Well, it says first, all the peoples round about. Now, in Psalm 83, for example, there's a prophecy. And Asaph, who wrote that, he speaks about how the nations around Israel are going to attack. And God says, for those who do it, keep reading in the middle of verse 2. It says that for those nations around about, they're going to come against uh, Judah, and the siege is going to be also upon Jerusalem. And what's going to happen to be? It says, on that day, God's going to do something. Look at verse 3. Now, verse 3, we see the expression, Be'yom Hahu. We've talked about that. That expression means on that day, but a specific day the great day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment, the day that, that all people are going to have to give an account unto him. So it's also seen, that expression, Be'yom Hahu, is seen as a transition as well from this age to the age to come. And notice what God says, verse 3 once more, and it'll come about on that day that I will make Jerusalem a, a stone of what? Of, of weight. And all the nations, and that's what he says here, all the peoples that come up, it says that this stone is going to be upon them and they're going to do something. Now, it's an expression. We see it in a couple places. In the Torah, for example, this, this cutting themselves. Now, what is that in regard to? It is a form of idolatrous worship, of that worship which God has never sanctioned. So those peoples and nations that are coming up to Jerusalem for war, when, when they begin to be judged by God, they're going to begin to cut themselves. That is, they're going to turn to their idols for assistance. Just like we see in the book of, of 1 Kings chapter 18 and the prophets of Baal, they did the very same thing. Well, look on in the verse 3, and he says, and I will gather them unto her, that is, that they should be, all those nations shall be gathered unto Jerusalem, all the nations of the earth. And that means not just the ones around, but there's a change in language. To all the nations of the earth. And that means 
every single nation. Israel's going to stand alone, but in the end, by, by the work of Messiah Yeshua and his return, Israel's going to be victorious. Look at verse 4. On that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse. Now, you've heard the expression horsepower. So here, we're not just talking about literally horses, but what horses represented at that time period, and that was power. It was a key military uh, equipment. So that's what we're talking about. God is going to strike the, the weapons of the enemy with timahon, that is with, with a form of, of amazement. They're not going to work, in other words. He says, and the riders, that is the soldiers, he is going to strike them with what? Shigaon, which means they're going to become uh, mad or, or insane. And upon the house of Judah, he's going to do something. He says, I'm going to open my eyes. Now, that's an important statement. Why? It tells us that from the destruction of the second temple nearly 2,000 years ago, it's been as though God's eyes have been closed to Judah. But in these last days, he's going to open them up and he's going to bring redemption and fulfill his covenant promises to the Jewish people. So he says, I'm going to open up my eyes on the house of Judah. And he says, and every horse of the people, they're going to be struck with blindness. That is, they're not going to function properly like we've learned. Look at verse 5. And the champion of Judah is going to say in his heart, and it uses the term atzma, which in ancient Hebrew means courage or, or confidence or power. He's going to say, there's power to me. Who's saying that? The dwellers of Jerusalem in the Lord of hosts, their God. Now, why does it say that? It's kind of awkward. The dwellers of Jerusalem in the Lord well, that term, and we're going to see it repeated over and over, that term, dwellers of Jerusalem, according to the ancient sages, it is an expression that speaks of those who want to worship God. Jerusalem, a place where he caused his name to dwell, a place of worship. So we see over and over that those who want to worship God. Now, what's the key? You can't worship God in and of yourself. Only the congregation of redeemed. And that's what God's going to bring about for the Jewish people in these last days. Look on, if you would, to, to verse 6. On that day, I will make the champions of Judah as a, a basin of fire that's set against trees or wood, as a torch of fire against the, the sheaves. Now, if you put fire among the sheaves or among wood, it burns it up, it consumes it, and that's what it says. It is going to devour on the right and on the left and all the peoples round about. It's speaking about his judgment, and then look at the end of verse 6. It says, and Jerusalem again will dwell in her place in Jerusalem. Now, that's important because there's some Bible teachers that teach that there's really no more significance to Israel. When it speaks about Jerusalem in the Bible, it's using it as a metaphor for the kingdom. We really shouldn't think about the Jerusalem of today. But that's not what this prophecy says. Jerusalem is related to the kingdom. But the Jerusalem of the kingdom, that millennial kingdom that Messiah is going to rule over for a thousand years, where is going to be located? In the Jerusalem of today, that same location. So there's an emphasis upon that, that God's going to keep his covenant promises exactly as the old covenant promises. Verse 7. Now, when we get to verse 7, we enter into the second half of this 12th chapter. And there we see the means for this victory. It's going to be a difficult journey, but the end is going to be redemption for Israel. Remember what we talked about in verse 1, that word Messiah, burden, but in the end, that creation, that second creation or redemption. How is God going to do it? Well, look at verse 7. And Hashem, that is a term for the God of Israel. Hashem, he will save the tents of Judah as he's done in the former times. On account of this, it says, the, the splendor of the house of David 
will not be greater than the, spl the splendor of the dwellers of Jerusalem concerning Judah. So here again, he begins to talk about two groups of people, and there's a relationship. He's going to make them one in Judah, that is, in the nation. Those who are Bet David, the house of David. Now, here again, the house of David, we're not talking about the literal descendants of David, but the spiritual descendants. The house of David, if you look at that in the scripture, it's almost always tied to a messianic context. For example, that promise of a virgin conceiving and giving birth is made to who? The house of David. Over and over, the house of David are those who believe that there is a Messiah. They, they have that hope. They are remaining steadfast for Messiah to be revealed to them. And it says, what is their desire? Well, Yoshev Yerushalayim, the dwellers of Jerusalem, they want to know how to worship God and Messiah's foundational in that. In fact, without a covenantal relationship with Messiah, you can't worship God as the word of God commands that he be worshiped. Move on to verse eight. On that day, on that day, the Lord will defend the dweller of Jerusalem. He is going to move to defend those who want to fulfill the purpose why God created humanity in the first place, and that is to worship him. There's going to be, in this difficult time, people, both Jew and Gentile, turning to God. And the ones who do that, God is going to defend, first and foremost, He's going to do that for Israel as Israel is being physically attacked by this great army. And it says in the middle of verse 8, those who are a failure in the flesh, God on that day is going to make them like David. Who's David? A mighty warrior. And he's going to make the house of David, those who believe in Messiah, he's going to make them as God. What's a statement? Powerful statement. Make us as what? God. What does that mean? It means that, that God in this passage has to do with judge, that we're going to judge the enemy. It says we're going to be as the angel of God stands before us. Nothing to fear, and he's going to bring about victory. Look at verse 9. And it shall come about on that day I will seek. And what God seeks, he will accomplish. He says on that day, remember the context, judgment, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come up towards Jerusalem. For what purpose? For war. Now we get to a very important passage. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 10. There we see a description of Messiah. He says, I will pour out upon the house of David. Who's the house of David? Those who believe in a Messiah. Now, it's very important to understand, up until this time, these individuals, Bet David, the house of David, they have faith in a Messiah, in that promise that God made, those promises that we can read about in the prophets. But these individuals do not know who Messiah is. And let me tell you, there is, it's a good thing to believe in a Messiah, but that will not bring about redemption. It's only when you know who that Messiah is and what work he has done in order to make redemption a possibility and hopefully a reality for you. So what is God doing? Look again at verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and upon the dweller of Jerusalem. Here again, Messiah and worship. These two themes go together. What's he going to pour out? The spirit of chen. Now that word chen is a Hebrew word best translated grace. The next thing that is said, also the spirit of supplication. Now, that word supplication has in it the same word for grace. So understand what's going to happen. God's going to pour out grace, and at the same time, he is going to cause individuals who are looking for Messiah, who are wanting to worship him, they're going to seek God's grace. That's what that Hebrew word means. So they're going to seek God's grace, and how is that grace manifested? Well, this passage speaks of a great day of revealing. Verse 10, second half, it says, And they shall look upon me. Now, it's important in this scripture to realize something. The first person singular, that is the word 
I, is used over and over. And every time it's used here, I this, I that, it's speaking about who? I, the Lord God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is how it's usually referred to in this chapter. So it's speaking about God. But everyone, both Jewish scholars, and not just Jewish scholars, but also in Judaism, there's an authoritative writing called the Talmud. And in this, in the section called Sukkah, on the, the 52nd uh, page, and on the first side of that page, it says that this verse, it quotes it, is in regard to Messiah. Now, it's interesting. When we look at the context, if you go back to verse 7, it says, and the Lord will save. But when it says in verse, verse, verse 10, I will pour out, who's that? That's God. And it says, I will what? They will look upon me. Who's that? That's God. But everyone says it's Messiah. Why? It says, they will look upon me who has then been stabbed. Now, that's important because this stabbing, the rabbinical scholars say, we're speaking about Messiah, but Messiah ben Yosef. According to Judaism, there are two Messiahs. Messiah ben Yosef, why that title? For two reasons. One is Messiah ben Yosef is that suffering servant. Joseph, when he went down to Egypt, what happened? He suffered greatly. He was in prison for approximately 10 years of hard labor. So he suffered. But that suffering was to put him in the position where he could bring about redemption for the Jewish people when he provided food and he saved Egypt and the Jewish people there. He saved them in exile. Now, why is that important? Because Mashiach ben Yosef is going to do the same thing. He is going to save us when we're in spiritual exile. What's that? Lost in sin. The second reason he's called Messiah ben Yosef is because when the brothers, that is when the children of Israel, those sons, came down to Egypt, they saw Joseph, they talked about him, everything that was happening to them, all these bad things at the beginning, they said it's all because of what we've done to our brother, Joseph. So they were thinking about Joseph, speaking about Joseph, and there he was standing before them, and they did not recognize him. In fact, when Joseph, when he called them to have a dinner with him, and he pushed everyone out except for him and his 11 brothers, he says, I am Joseph. And they didn't get it. In fact, what's important, and you can look at this in the book of Genesis, it wasn't until Joseph revealed himself the second time that his brothers received him, understood who he was. And that tells us, it tells us that it's going to be for Israel's Messiah's second coming, and that's what we're talking about, that Israel in great numbers is going to receive him, that it's going to be a great day of salvation for Israel. And that's what this passage is speaking about. Look again at verse 10. I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the dweller of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as the mourning of an only begotten, that is an only begotten son, and the, 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 the bitterness will be for him as the bitterness of a firstborn. Now, why is that important? Well, we're going to talk about it next week. This type of mourning is for 30 days. We'll talk about the significance of that, but there's mourning. Why? He's not dead. He's alive. But the reason why mourning is taking place is because Israel, as a nation, did not mourn Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, when he came the first time and he suffered like that suffering servant and he died, there was no mourning for him. So now when he returns and they look upon the one that has been pierced, they're going to re realize, they're going to understand who he is, that he is Yeshua, Jesus that came the first time but was rejected, just like the brothers rejected Joseph. But now he's coming back to do what? Well, look at verse 7. It says, And the Lord shall save the tents of Judah as in the former days. 
He's doing the work of saving. He is defeating the enemies. Remember, I will seek to destroy all the peoples that come up to Jerusalem for war. That's the work of Messiah ben David. Now, here's the key. Judaism has it wrong. There are not two different messiahs, but there's one messiah that has two very different calls. The first call to come and do the work of redemption, to suffer for sin, which he did upon that that cross 2,000 years ago. But just like the people didn't recognize Joseph in Egypt, they didn't recognize Messiah ben Joseph. But when that Messiah ben Joseph comes back and he's going to do the expectation of the second Messiah, ben David, the son of David, and deliver the Jewish people from their enemies, then they're going to recognize him and understand there's not two messiahs, but one who does two very different works, the work of redemption spiritually and the work of redemption physically, bringing the victory to the Jewish people over their enemies and ultimately establishing that kingdom. Now, what we see here is that this is taking place in a very specific location. Look, if you would, to verse 11. It says, on that day that the morning in Jerusalem will not be greater than the morning that was in Hadad Rimon, where? In the valley of Megiddo. Now, that valley of Megiddo or Megiddon is the very place that you know of in the New Testament known as Armageddon. And what we're going to see is this. Messiah, there's three places that he returns. The first place he returns is in Batsra. We read about that in the book of Isaiah chapter 63 at the first part of that chapter. He's going to judge Edom and their mountain, Mount Seir. Edom is going to be the leader of all the nations to go up against Israel and try to capture Jerusalem. The second place he's going is right here, Armageddon, to defeat all of those armies. And the third place, the final place, is the Mount of Olives. We'll see that when we move on to Zechariah chapter 14 in two weeks. And we see his return there in victory to establish that kingdom. So this passage is critical in understanding the person, the work, and the identity of Messiah Yeshua. Two works the work of paying the price for sin, and the work of bringing about the kingdom, both of those have to do redemption. And that's why Messiah is known as the Redeemer. And my question to you is this, have you experienced his redemption? Have you invited him into your life, allowing his blood to pay the price of your sins so that when he returns, well, at that time, you'll be part of that kingdom? Well, my time is out. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, 